to the name of Jesus. We sing a song, we believe in God the Father, maker of the universe, and in Christ, his son, our saviour, come to us by virgin birth. We believe he died to save us, for our sins was crucified. Then from death he rose victorious, ascended to the Father's side, and then we continue on. Jesus, Lord of all, Lord of all. Jesus, Lord of all, Lord of all. Jesus, Lord of all, Lord of all. We sing. Quite a few times we sang that time. And also, another song, Lord, I long to see you glorified in everything I do. What? Everything? Everything I do? Do you? Do you glorify the Lord in everything we do? The words, I long to see you glorified. I long. What does that mean? You find a few words in the thesaurus, words like desire. Words like yearning, words like craving, craving, I long to, I crave to see you glorified in everything I do. When we sing this song, <clears throat> we are saying with our mouth, I desire to see you glorified in everything, in everything I do. But do we? In everything we do? Because if the Lord is really the Lord, then that's the idea of him being Lord. Do we give him the glory or do we keep it to ourselves? Or would, when all is said and done, would you really think God's glorified in that? Jesus, Lord of all eternity, your children rise in faith. All the earth displays your glory. And each word you, that is Jesus, speaks brings life to all who hear. Mm. Jesus has the words of eternal life, and they come through us. The chorus goes, Lord of all. We sing it, Lord of all. And sometimes you can just sing it, Lord of all, yeah, yes, yeah, so have a lovely day outside. <laughs> <clears throat> but it's Lord of all, all of creation, sing your praise in heaven and earth. Lord, we stand, hearts open wide, be exalted. In Philippians 2, verse 9, Paul said, Therefore, God, God has highly exalted him, that is Jesus. That means to elevate above all others, <clears throat> to rise to the highest position. And that's where Jesus is today. And that's how Jesus, who we come to worship and who we live for each day. This is the same Jesus that we read about in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with our feelings or our infirmities, but was in all point tempted like we, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy, find grace in the time of need. Our Jesus, who we talk to, who as our high priest, has been highly exalted by God. Above all, that's the name of our Jesus. And given him the name which is above every other name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven and on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> When we confess Jesus as Lord, it is to the glory of the Father. Confess the Lord Jesus Christ to the glory of the Father.
verse Corinthians chapter 10, verse 37, 31 says, Therefore, whether therefore you eat or drink, whatever you do, <clears throat> do all to the glory of God. Jesus came from heaven to earth, born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, lived a perfect life and died on the cross an atoning sacrificial death, was buried in a tomb and raised victoriously and ascended into heaven to sit with his father in the glory of his father, with his father, highly exalted. And then we sing, Lord, I lived. Lord, I lived. That is, Lord, I elevate you. I lift you up. I lift you on high, just like God has lifted you up. I lift you up too. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. <clears throat> Jesus, show us how to have a Lord. How to subject to a Lord. How to love a Lord. And how to obey a Lord. Jesus showed us God. Jesus showed us his Father, his Lord. And our Lord. Lordship was at the very heart of Jesus' redemptive work on the cross. It was the Lordship of his Father that propelled Jesus along in his work. So in Romans 14, verses 8 to 9, for if we live, we live to the Lord. So we have life here, we live it to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. <clears throat> For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Have you ever wondered how many times we sing, or oh, sorry, the word Lord is in our chorus? What well, will this is we have a song? Ever? thought about how many times the Lord would be there. I started to count it up. I just went through. Just for this. I got to 700. And I kind of lost count. Somebody's going to prove me wrong. I think it was around 700, but I was going so fast. <laughs> so around about 700 plus, I extrapolated. That's the word that Alan uses. I extrapolated to around about 700. That's a lot of times the Lord is in our that we could sing Lord if we were singing all our choruses. <clears throat> Proverbs 17, verse 22. A merry heart does good like a medicine. Like a medicine is a merry heart. A broken spirit drives the bones. And a little note from Adam Clark here. Nothing has such a direct tendency to ruin health and waste our life as grief anxiety, fretfulness, or bad tempers, etc. All these work death. But to the last line of the song, it says, but a merry heart is the joy of the Lord. Okay, that's not in Psalm 17, 22. Sorry, it's not there. But it's another song we sing, so that's all right. We sing, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy. Okay. It's, we sing it four times in a row. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Talking to ourselves and speaking to ourselves if we don't know already, but the joy of the Lord is definitely our strength. It makes us strong. And I don't know about you, but I certainly have had many experiences where the joy of the Lord has been my strength. But these words are found. The only time I can actually find the word for word were in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. What a wonderful declaration of lordship 
we find in Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah. Lordship, obedience, and sacrifice, and the Lord showing his strength through his men. In the book of Nehemiah, there was a restoration in the hearts of the people of God. For the people of God had been captive been captive to God's servant Babylon, which we were going to find out about in another song. It happened because they were not truly living as God as Lord. This is what happens when you're not glorifying God. A time of separation from the house of God had gone on a long time, and the hearts of certain people were being stirred up to return and rebuild and repair. Now, this rebuilding had been a, 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 taken a real long time, and it was a time of tremendous testing. After the time of building, the people came together, and as I read from the law, this was the time when people had a real respect for the law of God, and when it was open, they stood up. So Ezra read from the law, <clears throat> and the people were instructed in what it meant. Then it says, they mourned. But Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 9, and Nehemiah and Ezra and the Levites that the taught the people said unto them all, this is a Hold, this, this day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord. Verse 10, then he said unto them, go. Then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fruit, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing has been prepared. For well, this day is holy unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. They made God their Lord again. They returned to the Lord again. They were built all the broken bits in their lives and all the bits that had been torn down by the enemy. And they received the word of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord gave them the strength. They had come through some pretty tough stuff. Destruction of their homes, captivity, shame for the house of the Lord. Then, trying to rebuild all around them, opposition. They had to fight for every brick that they put back in the wall. But in the end, the joy of the Lord was their strength. A merry heart is the joy of the Lord. A truly merry heart is only merry because of the joy the Father gives. True joy comes as a result of what God does. That's our Lord. And when we have a merry heart gained and attained by the word of God, it gives God joy. The Lord likes a merry heart. It's the joy he likes to see in his people. We sang the songs before about making the Lord smile. I'm so glad that I've made you smile. And those words are appropriate here. Then we sing another song, <clears throat> which is connected to the last song that you most from David and Noah. Ah, Lord God. How many times can we say that? Especially when times are a little bit difficult. Ah, Lord God. Behold, thou hast made heaven and earth. By thy great power and outstretched arm, there is nothing too hard for thee. There is nothing too hard for thee. This ought to be our response to the Lord of us all. Ah, Lord God. There is nothing too hard for thee. These words were inspired by God and came out of the mouth of Jeremiah, a man who knew his Lord as Lord. Jeremiah was declaring the coming judgment and declaring what his 
what the Lord was going to be doing to Jerusalem through the hands of Babylon. And at that very time, Nebuchadnezzar was knocking on the gates of Jerusalem, as it were. Let me in, let me in. If you don't, I'll burn your house down. And that's what he did. The siege walls were going up all around Jerusalem. And destruction from Jerusalem, of Jerusalem, was underway. There was no way of stopping it. And at that time, he, Jeremiah, he was in prison because of the things that he was saying about Babylon being the hand of God. But God told Jeremiah to go by a field in Anathoth, which was outside of the wall about three miles away. And it was being offered to him by a relative of his. God told him to buy it. And the Lord said to him, well, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. And nothing at all looked like that would ever happen. And so Jeremiah's words were our Lord God. And these words declare the glory of God. There is nothing too hard for thee. And this was his song, his words. No matter what was going on, nothing is too hard for thee. And these are the words that the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are all about. Nothing is too hard for thee. God told Jeremiah to buy a house. And he did it because he knew that nothing is too hard for God. And there is a coming a day for us too, when once again God will shake terribly the earth as we know. And you better believe it that our Lord God, he can and he will do it. But this time, it's not going to be an old house that we're going to be rebuilding, but there's a new house coming, the city of God. But that's impossible, isn't it? That's just too many comic books you've been reading. It's impossible. <laughs> it's not going to happen. You're dreaming. Ah, Lord God, there is nothing too hard for thee. I think God is the only one that lives in reality. Mm. <laughs> there is nothing too hard for thee. In this house we dwell, full of pain and strife, and we long to be free for a mortal life. As we know in your word, we'll be changed. Yes, we're heard. When we meet him there in that city, as we wait with hope for what we believe for our Lord's soon return, to bring earth its peace, for it's now that we grieve from sin to be relieved as we wait hand in hand for that city. On that day, we will sing holy, holy. On that day, we'll bow down in the light and then we'll rise and turn our eyes to the one who's the light of that city. Though my eyes cannot see what is waiting there, though my tongue can't conceive all that he's prepared. Then the blind will see the sun, what was old will be young, and the lame will run all over the city. Amen. Ah, Lord God, there is nothing too hard for me. Every time I read that, when I wrote it, I keep crying. And uh, it's hard to do that right now. It's quite an emotional song, I feel. Mm -hmm. And then we will sing. All hail King Jesus, all hail Emmanuel, Lord of King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Bright morning star, and throughout eternity I'll sing your praises, and I'll reign with you throughout eternity. But to be part of this moment, Jesus has to be Lord of all. There never was a name like the name of Jesus. 
so representative of sacrificial love at its best. Such an excellent demonstrator of lordship. And someday every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. And we sing, we will cross every border, throw wide every door, joining our hands across the nations. We'll proclaim Jesus is Lord. Is that us? We will break sin's oppression, speak out for the poor, announce the coming of Christ's kingdom from east to west to shore to shore. We will gather in the harvest and work while it's day, that we may sow with tears of sadness like ne Nehemiah and Ephraim. We will reap with shouts of joy because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Soon our eyes shall see his glory, the Lamb, our risen Lord. When he recedes from every nation, his blood will bright our great reward. Then we'll proclaim Jesus is Lord. We shall proclaim Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. So long as we do it today, he is Lord. So then, when the Lordship of Jesus Christ is the solid rock of our life, a solid rock on which we stand in our Christian life. All other issues will be settled in our life. There won't be any more problems. And we sing the song, he's the solid rock on which I stand. He is the Lord, the risen man. The lamb who sits upon the throne. Whose throne is he sitting on? And are we sitting on the throne with our Lord Jesus Christ? He is our Lord. And if we're sitting with him, when he's a solid rock in all our relationships, no other issues have a problem. When the Christian builds his life on the Lordship of Jesus Christ, then all other issues are settled. When Jesus is Lord of our life, we will fulfill our duties, and our obligations, and our responsibilities with joy. It's a quite a well, there's a quite a well known saying among Christians, you would have heard it several times, no doubt. Unless Jesus is Lord of all, He is not Lord at all. This should be a challenge to all Christians if they don't believe it or not. It still should be a challenge to bring the every area of our life to the sovereign rule of Jesus Christ. In our lives, there should be no rivals for the throne of God. Unless Jesus is Lord, he is not Lord of all. Well, as we have seen with Israel, the people didn't want God to be Lord. And this is what happened. It's traditional at this time of year to make plans. You come and make New Year's resolutions. I don't, because I don't think I've ever, ever, ever managed to keep them. <laughs> but for us, is Jesus really Lord in the plans that we might think to make at the beginning of the year of the Lord? James 4, words we know very well. Go to now ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city okay. and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then vanishes away. Well, that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or do that. And by the way, we do not make Jesus Lord. He already is Lord. Mm -hmm. So we just got to kind of catch up. Jesus has been Lord forever. We've got to catch up. We've got to catch up and surrender all. Surrender all to the sovereign will of the Lord Jesus Christ. All to Jesus, we say. I surrender. But is that true? We know in our head that Jesus Christ is Lord. If it is true, do I really believe that? Should that individually compel us, each one of us, to preach the message of Jesus Christ as being Lord among the nations with urgency? When we accept Jesus Christ as Savior, 
And week by week, we remember his death and his resurrection. But we cannot and do not receive a reminder only as a saviour. We remember and receive him as both Lord and saviour. What does it mean to say that Jesus is Lord? Well, Jesus to be Lord in our life means that, we, that he is the ruler, the boss, the master of our whole life. He cannot be Lord of a part. He must be, in, must be given complete control of our whole life. Paul wrote, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We kind of almost live two kind of lives. There's an inner kind of a life, and there's a public kind of a life. Jesus has got to be seen and in control of both what we like to hide and what we make seem. Is Jesus Lord of our whole life? Is Jesus Lord of your thoughts? Is Jesus Lord of your emotions? Is Jesus Lord of your speech, of your relationships, of your possessions? Is Jesus Lord of your whole life? What does it involve to say Jesus Christ is Lord? What must a person do in order for Jesus Christ to be Lord of all his life? One word, and I always remember John Aldersley when I think about this, the word yield. Sign of a stop somewhere overseas you mentioned once many years ago. Yield. Yield to him. That makes Jesus Lord of your life. It involves you taking your hands off the controls, allowing him to take control of your life. Such an important question requires a lot of thought. Paul addresses the subject in 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You were brought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body. In your spirit, which are God's. We are not our own. We were bought at a price. We belong to Jesus. We are his purchased possession. When a person yields to the Lordship of Christ, he or she acknowledges his ownership and gives up his or her personal rights. Yield to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus. Uh, asked a particular question one day when he was with the disciples. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and big deep. And laid the foundations on the rock. And when the flood rose and the stream beat the heaven leap on the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house on the earth, against which the stream did beat the heaven leap. And immediately it fell, and the ruin was so great. Are you doing what the Lord has asked you to do? Finally, the Lordship of Jesus Christ involved willing, willing to serve, as we've heard about this morning. There must be a time in your life when you, like the prophet Isaiah, are willing to say, here I am. Here I am, Lord, send me. Anywhere, anytime, at any cost. <laughs> I didn't want to say this. But the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our life involves our willingness to go where he sends us. When he sends us, regardless of the cost. And Jesus, the Lord of 
this area in our life. Can you honestly say anywhere, Lord, any time, any cost? The Christian life is a wonderful life, but the term a wonderful life is often analysed by our own opinion of life. Some may say a wonderful life is just having a lot of stuff, a lot of fun. Christ has made every provision for his children to live full and abundant lives, but there is an individual cost to all of us. Such a life requires us to have Jesus as Lord. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from this grace that I found in you. And Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love. Hold me close. All to you. All to you. I give it all to you. May this year indeed be the year of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Truly the year of the Lord for us.